She was pulling my hair. Down. It's Casper. I'm a park guide here. Uh, if you'd like to join me, I'm gonna go on the history tour. What that entails is about 20 or 25 minutes worth of us talking. Uh, we're gonna head through the story center, talk about the history of the bridge and the park. Then we're gonna head to the Cayapolano area and talk a little bit about the First Nations culture and practices that we see in this area. So I'd like to start off by recognizing that we're currently on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Those are our local groups of First Nations people here in Vancouver. They're part of the umbrella term of Coast Salish peoples here on the West Coast. So we just like to recognize that we are on their traditional territory. And like I mentioned before, we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of the specific parts of their culture later on. But for now, we're just going to head this way into our story center and start talking about why there's a bridge here in the first place. So come on down. Just here and introduce you to our founding father of sorts. His name is George Grant Mackay, and he's just here with the excellent beard and bow tie combination. Now, when George came over here from Scotland back in 1888, there was a huge rush to acquire land here in Vancouver to get access to all of our great natural resources. So George hopped right on board with that. He actually became the very first parks commissioner here in Vancouver and was responsible for setting aside the land that would later on become Stanley Park. But in terms of his own personal time, he actually purchased a great deal of land, around 6,000 acres back then, and he bought it for a pretty good deal, too. He got it for $6,000. I don't know how much you folks know about North Vancouver real estate prices now, but we'd be looking at upwards of $7 billion to purchase that much land nowadays. So uh, George knew when to buy in bulk. Now, when he bought this land, he chiefly wanted to use it for recreational purposes. So he and his family would come up here to hunt, hike, and fish, just to generally escape the hustle and bustle of the city and all of their jobs and everything like that. So in their explorations, a 10-kilometer hike down the side of the river to the shallow point at the bottom, cross there, and then come 10 kilometers back up the other side. That's a 20-kilometer round journey to only end up a canyon away from where you started. And I don't know about you folks, but that does not sound very convenient to me. And it mustn't took to George either, because he decided that he was done with it, and he sold off all 6,000 acres of his land. Now, just before that, I'd like to show you what he built the original bridge out of. So we're just going to head down here. So just before George sold off his land, he did do something very important here. He built the first suspension bridge. So it was originally constructed out of this hemp rope right here, uh, which you can see is, it's a good size rope, but I don't know if I trust it to hold me 230 feet above the Capilano River. This rope held together cedar planks like these ones just down here. And as I'm sure you can imagine, that original bridge was incredibly for itself to businesses. The first of which was a sawmill, which was a little bit upriver from here. Uh, and he actually was responsible for building the Capilano Flume, which ran from that mill down to the river. And it's basically just a big water slide for logs to transport them down so that they could be exported from our port down there. This time we'll see Edward, or pardon me, we'll see Elizabeth on the left-hand side of this photo. She's sitting there next to me very handsome young looking young man. His name is Mac McEachern. He was an RAF pilot in World War I and he came up here in the late 1910s to be a park ranger. And over the years of being alone in the forest together, he and Elizabeth would grow quite close and they got married in 1921. Oh, oh my god. 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 This is only done on the West Coast with Spanish and Lillowat West Coast natives because on our East Coast, the trees are generally part of the part of the part of Alright, so the pole that I'd like to tell you about is this very 
impressive one here on the left hand side. If you look up for me, you'll notice that this is an incredibly tall pole. This is taller than any of the other poles that we've looked at. And so far we've looked at an external house pole, so that house pole that was right on the front of the big house there, and we've looked at a story pole. Now there are seven distinct types of poles in First Nations communities, um, and we've only talked about three of them, so if you're curious, um, I can answer you. Hey, Rebecca, I have this uh, Yeah. If you listen carefully, 
the bridge? No! We can oh, go Yeah. 